Dreaming of a better sleep? Tossing and turning is not your destiny. And Ollie is here to help. Ollie invites you to sink into sweet, sweet slumber to improve your mental and physical health and overall wellness. More than just melatonin, Ollie's ingredients help you unwind your mind for a delightfully dreamy drift off. Sleep is on the way at Ollie.com. That's O L L Y.com. I was sort of um, vilified by the, the hardcore atheists as a religious apologist, right? <laughs> And, and when your book is called Religion as Make-Believe, I mean, <laughs> right? Are, 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 yeah. there, are there Christians out there like, oh, that's going to be really cool. This, is, this, is, this works for us. This is yeah. going to be good for us. <laughs> hey, everybody. I'm Dan McClellan. And I'm Dan Beecher. And you are listening to the Data Over Dogma podcast, where we increase public access to the academic study of the Bible and religion and combat the spread of misinformation about the same. Uh, how are things today, Dan? Well, it's a lovely spring day. Uh, the, the birds are chirping. The sun is out. And, uh, and we're going to make some people mad. <laughs> uh, what a lovely day, as the great yes. poet uh, once said. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All shiny and chrome. Okay, yeah. so we are very excited today to uh, welcome Neil Van Leeuwen to the show, or Van Leeuwen, if you're nasty. Uh, <laughs> Neil, thank you for being here. Neil is uh, Associate Professor of Philosophy and Neuroscience at Georgia State University in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, good old hot Atlanta. Uh, and, uh, and how are things today, Neil? Well, it's a beautiful day here. I'm really happy to be here. And uh, the sun is shining where I am as well. So I think, awesome. I think those are auspicious signs. We yes. <laughs> take uh, comfort in that. <laughs> auspicious is such a great word. Uh, I, I don't think a lot of people who um, refer to things as an August body are aware of the relationship of uh, August to auspicious to divination uh, based on the flight patterns of birds. So All right. um, yes, our the success of our endeavors today have been decreed by the flight patterns of uh, the birds. We have a little bit of snow on the ground here in Utah, but we can ignore that for now. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll be okay. We'll be okay. <laughs> and Neil is the author of a new book entitled Religion as Make-Believe. A Theory of Belief, Imagination, and Group Identity. Uh, and this is uh, a little bit outside of uh, the beaten path for our podcast because we're getting into um, cognitive neuroscience, evolutionary psychology. Uh, cognitive science of religion is, is kind of the, the generic title I have for, uh, for this field of study, which was a big part of uh, my doctoral dissertation. Uh, and that uh, I like to bring up from time to time. But I wonder, um, just because some of our listeners probably aren't familiar with uh, cognitive science of religion, of uh, evolutionary psychology when it comes to religion, can you tell us a little bit about the field as you perceive it? What do you think uh, this approach brings to the table? What are the main questions this research is trying to ask? And and um, if you're able to, can you just talk a little bit about how uh, the idea for your book came about based on, on your work in these fields? Yeah, sure. So I'll, I'll start with cognitive science generally, in case people aren't familiar with that phrase. So cognitive science is basically the more theoretical end of psychology and linguistics. So it's asking, well, what what is the basic nature of the psychological structures that guide certain behaviors like talking, like uh, watching movies, like getting in political arguments and so on? What are the basic structures and processes? So your experimental psychologists will gather data to test certain hypotheses and you can think of cognitive science as sort of the back end theory behind, well, what do the hypotheses even mean, mm -hmm. right? What is a belief? That's something that I work on. What is it to imagine an idea? How is imagining different from belief? And you, you start to see that cognitive science is really a place where philosophical questions meet psychological data. And that's, that's the space I've been working in for quite some time. Um, the way I got into working in cognitive science of religion, which is basically investigating the psychological structures behind religious belief and practice, is as follows. It kind of, I kind of got in there uh, uh, in a in a surprising way. So I was 
basically looking at the philosophical question of what is the difference between believing an idea and merely imagining it, right? Like you imagine something for the sake of make-believe play. Mm -hmm. In either case, you've got a mental representation of something. So just to give a concrete example, I could um, believe that there's a lion in the hallway, or I could imagine that there's a lion in the hallway. What's the difference? Either way, I'm representing it as if there's a lion in the hallway. And so I was developing a theory of what differentiates what I now call factual belief, fictional imagining, as mm -hmm. psychological relations or attitudes. And it hit me one morning because I grew up in a very religious context in the Christian Reformed Church. My dad and mom taught at Calvin College. My dad was an ordained minister. It struck me one morning, just sort of out of the blue when I was a postdoc, that it seemed like a lot of the religious attitudes of the people around me growing up, and including in my former self, they were much more like imaginings than they were like factual beliefs in terms of their psychological characteristics. Mm -hmm. And if that's true, it's hugely important. So I went from uh, this more purely theoretical philosophical enterprise of trying to do this conceptual slash theoretical work of distinguishing believing from imagining to investigating a lot of empirical psychological research, a lot of research in anthropology, basically a lot of empirical material that looks at the nature of religious activity broadly construed and seeing if it would actually support this hypothesis uh, that I developed, namely that a lot, of, a lot of religious beliefs are kind of sacralized imaginings. Yeah. I think that's a, a, I think a lot of people are probably bristling right now uh, because, <laughs> and you, you do go through this very methodically in the book. So I, I highly recommend that people read it and, and, and sort of to, to really understand where you're coming from. But I think a lot of people um, see their beliefs, uh, their religious beliefs, or, you know, what you would call, um, religious uh, 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 credences as as being just as real to them as you know their belief that that their house is located on the street that it's on, uh, and you make a very distinct uh, differentiation between those two things. Why why don't you talk about how those are could be considered different? Yeah, so I, I basically coin a term of art. I'm going to call, call it religious credence here like I do in the book. And I've, I've been writing about this for almost a decade now. My first big paper came out in 2014 in the journal Cognition. And where I say religious credence is different from factual belief. And um, it differs from factual belief in the way that imagining does. So let's just quickly go over kind of some of the main differences. Or actually, let's take one step further back, just so people can kind of get the notion of factual belief in their mind. So, so factual belief is just the way you relate to what you take to be knowledge, right? You could be mistaken about some stuff, but how things are for you at a basic level in the world, right? Like how you relate to the idea that your street is on, uh, that your house is on Smith Lane, that uh, apples are fruits, that your name is Dan and your name is Dan and your co-host's <laughs> name is Dan and your co-host's name is Dan. So all this kind of stuff that you just take for granted so much that you think about it, your relation to those ideas is what I call factual belief. It is, it's one of essentially epistemic confidence and um, you act as if the world is just like that. Whereas with, with imagining, it's, it's a different map layer in what I call a two-map cognitive structure, right? So I've got a chair over to the right to me. You can't see it. But I factually believe there's a chair in my office, another chair in my office. But I could fictionally imagine that, say, a wizard is sitting in the chair, all right? So um, what differentiates those two things, the imagining and the factual belief, is uh, one – imaginings are largely under voluntary control, right? Like my factual belief that the, the chair is in the room, I couldn't get rid of it just by choosing to. It's just, that's how it seems to me. So factual belief is, is involuntary, right? You could choose, you could say, hey, Neil, I'll give you a million dollars to stop factually believing that you have a chair in your office. And I wouldn't be able to get the million dollars. I could pretend 
to factually believe it, but you know, it's not under voluntary control. Whereas imagining that's under voluntary control. I can choose to imagine there's a wizard in the chair. I can choose not to and so on. I really liked that when I was reading it in the book, there was, there was, there was something so almost elegant about that differentiation. The idea that like, I don't have control over what I factually believe I'm like, and you know, you go on later to, to talk about how factual beliefs are, are, are sort of vulnerable to evidence and new evidence can, can alter a factual belief. But, uh, but the fact that I can't, I can't not believe something that I know or understand to be a fact uh, is a is is a sort of a wonderful differentiation between that and and other ways of of believing or or of knowing things. Uh, yeah, or other cognitive attitudes that's, more generally. That's right. Yeah, that, that, and that becomes a very big idea in your book is is this idea of cognitive attitudes. Do you want to yeah, go deeper exactly. into that idea? Sure, sure. So, so cognitive attitude, it's, it's just a philosopher speak and some psychologists speak this well for how it is you relate to or process a given idea. You can um, uh, factually believe a given idea. You can hypothesize a given idea. You can suppose a given idea. You can assume a certain idea for the sake of argument. Those are all different ways of relating to some idea. And one of the beautiful things about human cognition is that we have that flexibility to relate to ideas in different ways. So this is what philosophers also call the attitude content distinction, right? You, you can uh, have a different attitude toward the same content, or you can have the same attitude towards a different content and so on. So, so when we're talking about these attitudes, voluntariness versus involuntariness is one thing that really um, distinguishes imagining from factual belief. And then what I, what I argue on the basis of various anthropological evidence and, and, and things like that, just as well as uh, personal anecdotes, is that at least for a broad range of religious beliefs, they are adopted in a voluntary way. That doesn't mean that there's not outside pressures, but the fact that there is responsiveness to outside incentives shows that people are often choosing to have their religious credences. So what that shows, I argue, is that the religious credences with respect to voluntariness versus involuntariness, they're more like the imaginings than they are like the factual beliefs. So that's that's one first important point of, of differentiation. And then another one, uh, you know, this is not the order I go in in the book, but no matter, you mentioned evidential constraint, right? So our factual beliefs, uh, update in light of evidence kind of so fast that we don't even realize it. So if you uh, think that the supermarket is open till nine and then you um, see a sign outside the supermarket that says closing at eight, boom, your factual belief updates because you've got some good evidence uh, that's, that's contrary to it. And um, vulnerability to evidence is kind of the flip side of voluntariness. The reason factual beliefs are not under voluntary control is that they're basically at the whims of the evidence that the world throws at them. All right. I walk into my office and if the chair is not there, I, I might not know what happened, but I stopped factually believing that there are chairs in my office and so on. So by way of contrast, imaginings um, can be held uh, contrary to the evidence for, for as much as you like. So I want to imagine that lion in the hallway. There's no evidence that there's a lion in the hallway. I can look in the hallway and not see a lion. I can keep on imagining. So the imaginings aren't vulnerable to evidence. And here again, I say that the religious beliefs um, are not like factual beliefs. They're credences. They're mm -hmm. more voluntary, uh, uh, sorry, more free from evidence, they can be held um, uh, despite contrary evidence to a large extent, at least. Um, there's, there's obviously complications here, and I'm, I'm sure your listening, listeners are, are thinking of some, um, but there's plenty of reason to think that uh, not only can religious credences be held contrary to evidence, but sometimes people think of it as a virtue to do so. 
Yeah, I remember seeing one time a uh, a pastor being interviewed, and he said that if the Bible said that one plus one equaled five, he would be he would he would accept that over his worldly knowledge that one plus one equals two. And I thought mm-hmm. that 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 was an interesting uh, it different it it sort of shows the difference between uh, what you're talking about as a factual belief. Uh, and contrasts it with 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 how uh, religious beliefs end up working. I mean, what is he going to do when he has to balance his checkbook? <laughs> right. <laughs> well, and that's that some, that's that's something that you talk about that, I mean, which is that that sort of that two map system where you've got a sense of the world and you've got how how the material world around you works, and then this uh, this religious idea can be layered over top of that in a, in a, in a second mapping. Is that, is, is that a reasonable way of, 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 of summarizing what you say? And the, that's very much uh, reasonable. And it's also true that uh, the two maps function in different ways. And I think we're, we were about to bring out uh, another one of the differences in terms of how people's minds process the two maps. All right. So, I, I listened to your podcast on the the Dead Sea Scrolls, which which I really love. So I, I want to let's do a thought experiment, see if this works, right? With with the pastor that you mentioned, who says, "Hey, if if if, if uh, the Bible or whatever says one plus one equals five, I'm going to uh, accept that one plus one equals five. All right. So let's say uh, that your friend Kip was his name, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yep. Let's say say Kip uh, has a big discovery. There's a, a missing fragment of the book of Isaiah, and lo and behold, uh, it says one plus one equals five. Right, so we've got to add we've got to add one plus one equals five to the book of Isaiah, and this pastor is going to have to accept that one plus one equals five. Now, here's a question: Is he really going to act like that's true all the time and in all contexts? I'm going to say probably not. So <laughs> he might preach. One plus one equals five on Sunday. He might loudly declare it. He might uh, make a sign and try to get other people to say that as well. But I bet you when he's at home trying to balance his checkbook, he goes with the one plus one equals two. Right. And uh, that was that was a fanciful example. I just came up with it. So hopefully it was hopefully it was entertaining <laughs> for your audience. But there's actually a lot of evidence that one of the other processing differences between religious credence and factual belief is that the religious credences do have this characteristic of being compartmentalized. Mm. So they guide action. They, they, you know, if you religiously creed uh, something, it might guide your action in sacred and symbolic contexts, but very often it fails to guide action outside that. And that's very much like, again, imagining. So when you imagine that there's a lion in the hallway or, you know, you imagine that one plus one equals five, that might guide your behavior, your expressive behavior, so to speak, in make-believe settings or in this particular practical context, but not outside it. And that's what I call compartmentalization. Factual beliefs, they are operative all the time in guiding your behavior, right? They uh, effectively never turn off. You might... Pretend like you don't factually believe something, but even uh, in the setting of make believe play, say you're say you're pretending that a hard piece of concrete is a nice soft bed. Your factual belief that it's hard is going to guide how you lie down on it. You're not just going to flop down on it, right? You're going to kind of stretch out slowly or something like that. Right. So, in any given practical setting, your factual beliefs, how you take the world to be, is going to be operative in guiding behavior. They effectively don't have an off switch. But there's a lot of psychological and anthropological evidence, not to mention ordinary phrases like once a week Christian, that suggest that psychologically religious credences become inactive when it's not a sacred time or setting. Again, there's going to be lots of wrinkles to that story, and I'm happy to go into them. But just as we get the basic ideas on the table, uh, I think that's a pretty salient difference. And it's one that's relevant to how you do the cognitive science of saying, well, how are we going to classify and theorize the different mental states and processes related to religious belief? (laughs) 
When Johann Rahl received the letter on Christmas Day, 1776, he put it away to read later. Maybe he thought it was a season's greeting and wanted to save it for the fireside. But what it actually was, was a warning, delivered to the Hessian colonel, letting him know that General George Washington was crossing the Delaware and would soon attack his forces. The next day, when Rawl lost the Battle of Trenton and died from two Colonial Boxing Day musket balls, the letter was found, unopened in his vest pocket. As someone with 15,000 unread emails in his inbox, I feel like there's a lesson there. Oh well, this is The Constant, a history of getting things wrong. I'm Mark Chrysler. Every episode, we look at the bad ideas, mistakes, and accidents that misshaped our world. Find us at constantpodcast.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Hello everyone, it's Takuyi here. And I'm Gabby. And we are the hosts of History of Everything, a podcast which you can probably guess by the name is, well, I mean, it's about everything. Do you want to know why people thought potatoes were evil and would give you syphilis? Are you curious about all the stories of the terrible and stupid ways that people have kicked the bucket over the years? Do you want to hear tales about all of the different badasses of history and the lives that they had brought to life? Well, if so, then look no further. History of Everything is just the right podcast for you. It's available on Spotify, Pandora, and anywhere else that you get your podcast from. Join us for some fun and just see how weird and wacky history can be. I think there. I want to bring up two examples of uh, <clears throat> of ways I think that uh, bubbles to the surface in the real world. Uh, the first one is something I saw on Twitter yesterday. Somebody was was commenting their their father was some kind of prominent Christian pastor or apologist or something like that for the life of me. I can't remember who it is. But she was saying that when her mom was on the edge of death in the hospital, her dad did not let her grieve and said, if you believe in God like you claim to, you need to start acting like it and not be consumed with grief about the the likely loss uh, of her mother. And I think that's an example of the father who's who's obviously very conditioned to try to uh, let the credences guide the behavior, but knows there's a conflict there. Trying Ooh. to, uh, because this is a this is costly signaling, this is a credibility-enhancing display, this is a way to show my beliefs are so deeply ingrained in me that they do control my behavior, even when this is a conscious effort to overcome those behaviors, and he's trying to require it of his daughter, who's who's not so convinced that, that that's necessary, that that's going to uh, help her socially. She just wants to grieve because that's perfectly natural. And then the other example is um, famous experiments that Justin Barrett did with um, conceptualizing a non-natural entity where mm -hmm. um, he had a bunch of participants. They were uh, given short stories about a supercomputer and, and Superman and God, uh, little narratives, and then they let some time pass, and then they came back and asked them questions about the stories. And as they recalled the details, they not only... Um, more accurately recalled the more anthropomorphic representations of God, but even filled in gaps in the stories with thoroughly anthropomorphic representations of God. But then they did it again, only this time they had a questionnaire about about their their beliefs about God. And right before mm -hmm. they asked them the questions, they said, by the way, here's what you said you believe about God. <laughs> right. And this was all, you know, um, incorporeal, omnipresent, omniscient, all this kind of stuff. And then suddenly the anthropomorphizing went way down. And, and they concluded that until the theological correctness switch was on, they were yeah. just using their intuitive conceptualizations of deity, which are, are far more based on just our understandings of human beings. And then when suddenly it was like, oh, I have to... The, that context is triggered for theological correctness. Now they had to override their intuitions with, this is what I'm supposed to be believing about God. And so um, right. they were suddenly in a situation where it needed to be on. So it was very clearly compartmentalized in, in that situation. And there are all kinds of experiments that have shown this kind of stuff uh, in yeah. all kinds of different areas of, of what we label religion, I, which I think is just fascinating. Yeah, the, the Barrett studies are, are fantastic. Let me go back to this, this situation where the uh, father is telling it was the daughter not to grieve. I mean, first of all, how tragic is that, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the mother is 
is passing away and, and you have this stern message not to grieve. Um, and so the, the fact that he knew he needed to say that does itself subtly reveal that it's a different sort of cognitive attitude that he has, right? Otherwise, he just would have been like, well, why aren't you happy? She's going to heaven. All right. And I, I actually have a story about this from one of my critics. So if you, you'll indulge me for a minute, I'll share yeah. it. So Martin Boudry is a, is a um, uh, Flemish philosopher uh, who, who criticized my, my early papers. He's, he's a staunch atheist of, of, of the more militant variety. Okay. Um, and so he kind of was criticizing my work because he, he thinks it lets uh, religious people off the hook, right? So I was, I was sort of um, vilified by the, the hardcore atheists as a religious apologist, right? Um, does that, is that, are you, I, do you follow the twisted logic of that? By, I, I by do. Us? I, there I are, actually, I'm actually struggling to, to, to catch that. Where, uh, why does it okay. let, why does it let them off the hook? Bear, bear with me for a second. Okay. So I, I've got, Th this, this is a big, by the way, this is a big divide in, um, cognitive science of religion, whether right. this is, this is helpful for, uh, religious believers or whether this is devastating for religious believers, <laughs> this kind of scholarship. And I'm kind of like, it just, it just paints the nuanced complexity yeah. for what it is. Yeah. yeah. Right? Like, like if I'm it's not trying to take sides here. If it's motivated by one thing or the other, then are we even, you know, that, that, yeah. Que then, then one questions how it, how, like, what the, how well the science is being done, doesn't it? And, and when sure. your book is called Religion as Make Believe, I mean, <laughs> right? It yeah, does are, be, are, yeah. there, are there Christians out there like, oh, that's going to be really cool? This is, um, this is, this works for us. This is yeah. going to be good for us. <laughs> well, well, so let me, let me first deal with the, uh, um, the, uh, the atheists that my, my position has managed to piss off. Um, okay. So, so the, the line of reasoning goes like, or the, the sort of twisted psychological arrival at this point goes something like this. If you're a hardcore atheist, it's a lot easier to vilify religious people if you portray them as simply and straightforwardly factually believing that there was a talking snake in the Garden of Eden, that the sun stopped, that a virgin had a baby. That, that is this, delusion. Yeah. It's, it's, it's straight sort up of delusion. Like, Wow, if if someone yeah. just straightforwardly thinks that those things are true, they must be just irrational, delusional, foaming at the mouth. And if your motivation is to basically portray how bad religion is, it's kind of nice to to have the idea that there's straightforward factual belief in these entities. And here comes Van Leeuwen, you know, the the philosopher who's son of an ordained minister saying, "No, they're they're religious credences. They're not factual belief." that sort of deprives them of a, a weapon in their arsenal, hmm. right? So even though I'm not, I don't have any, uh, you know, ax to grind in, in defending religion, you know, I mean, does good things for, for some people, obviously does bad things for other people. And it's a massively complicated empirical question. Uh, but I was depriving them of a tool in their arsenal. And so that led to certain attacks, in, including one by uh, Martin Boudry and, and Jerry Coyne. Okay. And that, that was published oh. in the journal Philosophical Psychology in 2016. Well, I actually lived in Belgium for a year and I got to know Martin personally. And we're, we're actually uh, friends right now. Um, but he told me a very interesting story that actually sort of supports my distinction. So he grew up uh, as a, in a staunch Catholic environment. Okay. And he was playing with his little sister one day. I think I'm getting the story right. Martin can can chime in in comments <laughs> or whatever if he, if he ever hears this. He's playing with his little sister one day, and her sister, his sister, got her head stuck between the, I guess, the spindles of of a stair a stairway banister. I don't know if those yeah. things are called spindles, but you know the the uh, sort of spokes that come down. Uh, and he was there with his little sister and his his grandmother, and he was very young. Um, and his grandmother, of course, starts freaking out. How are we going to get her head out? She's 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 looking like she's going to choke. And Martin, who's you know a little bit of a literal minded guy, says, "Well, it's okay. She'll go to heaven." Yeah. Right. And so he he's like, well, "What's the problem? She's <laughs> she's going to paradise." And so that it, it does that story does a few things. One. It um, illustrates the, the flexibility of attitude and content, right? Because uh, most people, 
and the grandmother's, you know, fearful reaction and trying to get the the head out uh, uh, shows that she factually believed that death is death. Even if she religiously creeded that there's this eternal afterlife. Mm -hmm. Whereas Martin, who's, I don't know, maybe five or something at the time, he factually believed that there was this afterlife, right? right? And Martin told me, this is this is over dinner, he says, when I said to my grandmother afterwards, why were you afraid she was just going to go to heaven? That the grandmother kind of smiled at him as if he were naive, right? Right. As in, <laughs> this is this is a charming attitude to take. So she didn't want to correct him, but it's sort of like uh, you know the way you would react to a, a kid who who actually thought that Santa Claus had come down the chimney, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So this is um again when we're talking about you know death and afterlife you often see people talking one way but acting and fearing a different way. Again, yeah, it would it would be a horrifying thing for an adult to say, why are we worried about this child stuck in the thing? If they die, they just go to heaven. Like if an adult said right. that that same thing, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be charming, it would be it would be terrifying and and grounds for, you know, removal of the child from the home or whatever, you know. Yeah. Like you that. call child services. Exactly. So I think I th I think that's an excellent demonstration of 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 sort of your idea that there are these multiple uh these multiple things in operation at the same time. Uh when it because it's not like grandma didn't also have the religious credence that if the child were to die she would go to heaven theoretically. Yeah. So how how I'm curious how have people responded to this? I mean, when you say this, when I think about how I would have reacted to this uh, approach when I was a, a deep believer, and mind you, I was a teenager, so I'm, I'm not sure that it, my cognition, my, you know, my cognitive abilities would have been uh, excellent at, at receiving something like this. But I, I imagine I would have bristled quite hard at this. Yeah. Well, in terms of reception, it's it's been mostly positive. Uh, so far, I mean, it's 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 a newish book, so not that many people have, have read it that far. But but no hate mail so far. Um, <laughs> so Wait I'm, until I'm, our listeners get it, get their hands on it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but I will say, um, uh, I've shared my ideas with people who are uh, currently devoutly religious. I I spoke at um, a, uh, a a seminar uh, yes yesterday evening at at Georgia Tech up the street from Georgia state. And, and a few of uh, the students said, well, yeah, I'm, I'm devout Catholic. I'm a, I'm a devout member of the vineyard church. I'm a devout evangelical. And they weren't so hostile to the idea. They were kind of entertaining it. They, I think a couple of them were like, yeah, the title is a bit aggressive, <laughs> but in terms of, and I said, Hey, look, I wanted to, you know, catch people's attention. Um, and it does capture the idea of the book. Uh, but uh, they weren't really kind of angry that I had mischaracterized their psychology. They were kind of more t intrigued, right? Mm -hmm. So in terms of uh, people saying that I'm getting religious psychology wrong, it's mostly secular academics who are saying that and, and not the religious people themselves, right? So it's not, it's not like they clap their hands necessarily and say, you nailed it, Van Leeuwen. <laughs> Our religious beliefs are like imaginings, mm -hmm. uh, but they don't uh, bristle at it so much either, right? And partly that has to do with how I go about presenting it. You know, I'm, I, I don't present things in an, in an inflammatory way, or at least I, I try not to. Um, and then, but I also think that uh, for, for a lot of religious believers, there is some level of awareness that their religious beliefs don't operate like ordinary factual beliefs. And um, that, that's something that, that people often wrestle with, especially if, they, especially if they think that they should factually believe uh, their religious stories and doctrines, right? So it might be even like, yeah, my work is in some ways uh, a nice um, pressure valve for uh, uh, a normative pressure to have more epistemic confidence than they actually do in their mm. religious stories and, and doctrines. I mean, especially in a, a religious tradition, right? Like, uh, like I mean, a Christian tradition uh, where there's this 
not just enormous pr- pressure to to go to church on Sundays, but to have belief, right? Mm-hmm. And well, and it, and in the yeah. book you talk about, there's pressure not just to have a belief, but your belief isn't enough yet. You have to work harder. Mm-hmm. You have to do. You have to delve deeper. You have to believe more. Right. There's, there's a lot of pressure there, and I think part of that stems from the the recognition that there's something that this this belief is a little more um, uh, fleeting. This is not something that is uh, as embedded in our cognition as gravity. That if we trip, we're going to fall, and so it's the the I think people are constantly, particularly within strict religious traditions, trying to use how deeply embedded your beliefs are as a way of of signaling to others that you know I'm I'm one of the real ones. Um, yeah. I am faithful to to the group's ideals, and I my all of my existence is informed by those ideals. And so it, it functions very much to curate one's standing within, within a social identity. Um, mm-hmm. And I wanted to ask, um, when you talked about the, the militant atheist position that religious belief is, um, is delusion, which is a big part of, of other social identities, yeah. you're not saying that credences are entirely exclusive to religious belief. Uh, these are things anywhere there's there are um, strong social identities at work, there is potential for this kind of stuff to um, to come up as as identity markers and to be Absolutely. used that way. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'd love to, to to talk about that for a little bit because going back to the attitude content distinction, um, we can see that okay, once we've identified what this attitude of religious credence is. And basically it's imagining plus sacred values and group identity. That's the, that's the snapshot formula. How is, how is religious credence different from factual belief? Factual beliefs are your your ordinary, how you take the world to be religious credence is imagining plus group identity and sacred value. Um, So you can have that attitude in relation to all sorts of different things, right? Uh, in ways that might constitute your your group identity. So in in chapter six, I developed this notion, sort of more general notion that I call groupish belief, where uh, groupish beliefs um, are those that partly explain what group identity you have. And it's like uh, religious credence is a species of groupish belief because it works as a sort of internal identity badge. Well, your, your, your badge can have different insignia on it. Let's take a, by now, hopefully by now, somewhat comical example, right? Like people's attitudes towards uh, um, uh, surgical masks during the pandemic, right? Now, it should be something that you just have the factual beliefs that are are, are best evidenced, right? And, and sure, the, the evidence was ambiguous, so you should have maybe a, a sort of measured factual belief or degree of confidence or something like that. Well, the the idea that face masks work or that they don't work, right, became a, a sort of tribal identity marker, yeah. right? So people would have something like an ideological credence, so something that's not very responsive to evidence, toward uh, the proposition that face masks don't work, right? And then on the other side of, of, of the divide, someone might have an ideological credence toward the proposition that face masks do work. So, um, I mean, that's, again, a comical example. In a, I mean, you might think it's a tragic example, and perhaps both, both claims are right, of how humans, and we're weird creatures. I mean, we're really <laughs> weird that we can do this. We can have sacralizing attitudes toward all sorts of stuff. So I focus on the religious case because I think that's kind of the, the, in a sense, the purest and, and cleanest example of being able to take a sacralizing attitude of religious credence toward um, strange and, and interesting and supernatural propositions. I mean, but especially of lately in the, in, the, in the polarized political context in which we live, people end up taking uh, um, ideological credence or religious credence type attitudes towards propositions having to do with, uh, you know, whether guns 
prevent crime or cause more crimes, whether uh, uh, you know trans women are women or not women, towards whether face masks are effective, towards whether you know vaccines and so on uh, cause autism and things like that. So whenever you see these sort of entrenched positions where people appear loath, which one, identify in groups where people are loath to update uh, their beliefs in light of evidence and where you get a lot of signaling, right, which is a form of representational behavior, it's a good hypothesis that um, something like an attitude of religious credence is at play, right? And, and there's, there's a lesson there, and I don't know how to solve this problem, but if someone has a, a religious credence, say that vaccines cause autism, right? Just take that for example. You can, you can rub their noses in evidence till you pass out and it's not going to do anything, right? If they had a factual belief to that effect, they might just say, oh, oh I wasn't aware that the, the research has been updated. Oh, thanks for telling me, right? But um, so one of the things that I think is, is valuable about my framework is that it, it gives us the expressive power to distinguish different kinds of, of believing, if, if we'll use believing in, in that broader way, uh, even when it concerns the same content. Um, and I think that's hopefully useful for researchers, but also uh, people themselves for introspecting, well, what's actually going on with me uh, when I, um, when I uh, quote unquote, believe such and such a proposition? Are you interested in the parts of history that remain a mystery? Do you want to learn more about the historical myths and misconceptions used to prop up false belief today? I'm Nathaniel Lloyd. In my podcast, Historical Blindness, I delve into all of these topics, sharing puzzling tales from the past and examining hoaxes, conspiracy theories, and misremembered events that provide insight into modern politics and religion. Find out what's real and what's not when it comes to famous conspiracy theories, like those surrounding notorious assassinations and secret societies. Discover the weak and deceptive underpinnings of modern political ideologies and religious beliefs. Join me as I attempt to shed some light on our historical blind spots. New episodes every two weeks. Find historical blindness on most podcast players and platforms. This is actually something that I wanted to get to is uh, the the practical implications of this because it's it's one thing to to be able to acknowledge hey this is a credence this is where this is coming from but a lot of these credence and, and you you highlighted a handful of them they become identity markers and then yeah. they become dangerous they cost lives uh, I think they estimated two hundred and thirty two thousand plus people's lives could have been saved if they had chosen to to be vaccinated. And, and just yesterday, uh, I saw somebody on Twitter, someone with a, um, a large following say, uh, anybody out there who didn't get the vaccine regretting it yet? And, you know, thousands of responses saying, nope, 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 nope. And it was like, well, you can't ask the people who probably regretted it the most uh, anymore because they <laughs> passed away. Yeah. Um, and so- yeah. This is, I, I think, uh, in, in my work in, in the cognitive science of religion, not just with religion, but across the board, these identity markers that then get taken up as these, these credences in these, in these battles are sitting at the root of a lot of our social ills today. Um, and, uh, you know, like Harvey Whitehouse wrote a wonderful book, uh, The Ritual Animal, that uh, in part is discussing, hey... Um, Here's some things we can think about to try to uh, engage this. What do you talk about in the book as kind of the the implications, the practical implications of of your theoretical framework? Well, I think it's tough. I don't really go into practical implications that much in the book because I think it's it's a, a very difficult thing to just talk people out of their ideological credences, even if they're harmful to others. But I think there's there's one that I can share now that I've, I've kind of put into practice in my own life. And it has to do with how we use the word believe, right? And um, there's a, let me just give the audience a little bit of background. 
there's a kind of big difference in terms of how philosophers use the word believe and, and how lay people tend to use the word believe. So philosophers have come to use the word believe kind of for what I talk about as factual belief, right? So, so philosophers will say things like, you know, Fred has the belief that there is beer in the refrigerator, right? Which is kind of like, well, that's a funny way of talking. You know, most people would say Fred thinks there's beer in the refrigerator. Right. Okay. So, um, but given kind of the historical baggage with the word believe, it tends to be a sort of group identity marker, right? And that's why you, you see the word believe uh, when people recite creeds. And so it, mm. it's sort of like believe and there's semantic flexibility here and there's various uses and so on. But one very common use of believe is to show your group identity, right? So if you say, you know, in, in, in this house, we believe in science, Okay, mm-hmm. it's doing more than just saying, well, I think the, the products of, of scientific investigation uh, give us a good guide to how the world is. Notice I use the word think there, right? And it feels less aggressive. So here's, here's the, the kind of practical upshot of that, that I want to share that is, is maybe useful for talking to people who are kind of indifferent um, in groups from you, right? Religious versus not religious. So when people ask me, um, you know, if I, if I believe in God, I don't say I don't believe in God or I disbelieve in God. I say, well, I just don't think that there is a God, right? And even when I say this to people who are, are theists, um, it comes off as less aggressive, right? Because I'm, I'm reporting my factual beliefs. I'm not saying, hey, I'm opposed to what you are and my identity is opposed to what you are, but I'm just reporting my factual beliefs in, in as honest a way as I can. So, um, and I think we should do the same thing for when it, it comes to other ideological stuff, right? Like I think global anthropogenic global warming is a happening, right? And if you're, if you're talking to someone you, you disagree with and you say, well, I think on the basis of a lot of evidence that such and such it has less of that identity juice and it can be more productive, even though it's, it's less emotional. I mean, maybe because it's less emotional, it can be more productive for, for engaging in honest dialogue about things. So one of those tweaks you're, you're going to, when you hear someone saying, well, I, I believe in the Bible, not in science, the natural reaction, say, if you're like a sec- secular liberal like I am, is to come back with, well, I believe in the science. <laughs> but I think a more productive thing to say would be, well, I think science has given us a lot of accurate uh, descriptions of how the world is. Right. And then that'll invite a different kind of dialogue uh, from the, the, the believe you talk. I mean, I think one of the things that you're talking about that I think is so useful is this is the idea of somehow trying to decouple a practical conversation from the identity ideas. So like it, it, what I take from what you're saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, please, but what I take from that is like, if you can use your language to separate, to, 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 to extract the uh, the 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 sort of tribal elements of it out of the conversation. You're going to have a much more productive conversation if you can say this isn't about who you are versus who I am, but rather let's actually just tease out ideas and let those ideas sort of talk to each other. We're going to be in a in in better shape. We're going to be able to avoid some of the pitfalls that that credences can can give us. Yeah, I think I think that's right. Or that that'll be one of my one of my hopes for the book. And and then if since we're sticking on 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 the practical uh, applications for now, I'm I unfortunately don't think I have any sort of cure for the social ills that that stem from ideological credence. But I I do hope that my framework can help people in their own personal reflection and maybe alleviate some of the pressure to quote unquote believe and say, hey, well look. Maybe it's just the case that I, I have a religious credence that Jesus rose from the dead and, and not a factual belief. And, and that's, that's okay, right? Uh, that's that's going to be what, what faith is for me. And I think that might, uh, that sort of self-honesty might, might be uh, a healthy thing to realize. Now, I know that 
it's it's difficult to convince people to think critically about themselves. It's pretty easy to think critically about other people, but but we have <laughs> we have a hard time um, thinking critically about ourselves, particularly in public discourse, the kind you see yeah. on social media and and in a lot of the media. And you know, I make my living trying to engage uh, a, a lot of what's going on in in that discourse. And one of the the issues is that there's there's an awful lot of attempts to one up the other side. Like even in the way I talk about how the Bible develops, I talk about um, ratcheting up rhetoric about, you know, the the majesty and sovereignty of our God over and against Mm -hmm. your other God. And um, at least within the, um, my religious tradition, uh, the Latter-day Saint tradition, there's, uh, there is a lot of social capital in one upping even even claims to belief where when people testify share their their testimony it is i know and they will even mm-hmm. go into detail about how they are convinced um factually about uh these kinds of things and and there's a, there are a lot of rhetorical flourishes with every fiber of my being um i know and things like that and and we see that in some of the dialogue as well it's not so much well i i think this about vaccines cuz that's not going to be as rhetorically powerful uh but you have a lot of attempts to come over the top with well i know or this is just the way things are um and and i think that's that's wonderful counsel for for everybody on all sides of this to um to have a coke and a smile <laughs> and think a little more self-critically and try to engage not to defeat the other side but to to try to offer uh your perspectives in a way that can be accepted um you know in the spirit that they're given rather than in anticipation of of somebody trying to to take a swing back um which is and I'll, and I'm pointing at myself first. Not an easy thing to do. Mm. Yeah, but it's it's relieving, <laughs> right? Yeah, <laughs> kind of. It's like a big weight off your shoulder. Yeah, it is an interesting, uh, almost irony that while the what the, the category that you call factual beliefs, while that's, I don't want to say more real. It's uh, it. It, it operates differently and is sort of impenetrable unless new evidence comes to light. Uh, there, the, the religious credences or ideological credences are more incalcitrant. They're more, they, they, they can lodge themselves so firmly in a person and, and are vulnerable to almost nothing. If that feels that, that feels counterintuitive to me. Yeah, if, it's if, if well, the re, sorry, if the religious beliefs are 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 as you say closer to imaginings, it's mm-hmm. uh it's it's an it's interesting that they are so much harder to uh to to puncture or to or to even allow a question. Yeah, well, the way I would put it is is the psychological levers are are just very different. Okay, so it it's um. In, in a sense, as you're, as you're pointing out, it's, it's very easy to change people's factual beliefs. You just show them some contrary evidence and, and they, they update things. Whereas the, um, kind of what, what, uh, um, sociologists have found when, when people leave cults, it's sort of like you have to leave the cult, right? Mm. And so because, in a sense, because the motivation for holding religious credences is belonging to a certain group and it's sort of like that's what's hanging over your head if you don't at least profess what you religiously creed uh then it's kind of like you're stuck with them for as long as you're stuck as as for as long as you uh choose to or maybe are even forced to remain in a certain religious in group right so when when people do deconvert often what you see is people will certainly lose their religious credences when they when they deconvert but it'll go by way of changing social groups first and then and then dropping the religious credences right and so for example uh um uh if you if you look at what people say when they leave the vineyard uh church is they you know found maybe that there was a certain kind of uh social isolation 
that was uh, attending being in the vineyard church, or they'll cite the immoral behavior of the pastors and elders. And I'm, I'm uh, referring here to another ethnography of the vineyard by a, a, an anthropologist named John Bieleski. So the, the levers for adopting, uh, the psychological levers for adopting and getting rid of religious credences appear to be much more kind of social motivations uh, rather than evidence and logic and uh, straightforward reasoning and so on. So um, I guess I don't, uh, for me, I'm just kind of so used to thinking that way. I didn't, it doesn't surprise me to see that, but, but I think, I think the contrast is, is, is pretty striking once you, once you think about it. I think there, there are a lot of folks, uh, there's, there's a community on social media. They generally refer to themselves as a deconstructionist community is a mm-hmm. group of people, the formerly religious, who are trying to weed out of their cognition um, the the detritus of what what they were conditioned to accept as as a credence, and and so I I think a book like this can be incredibly helpful in in helping them understand the mechanism of how these things get in there, um, and and hopefully can help give people the tools to uh, more effectively and efficiently. Of go through and and uh, and weed them out, and uh, you your discussion about um, about staying with credences as long as you're in the with the in group makes me think of examples where the interests of the group change, and so mm-hmm. the credences then change. And the one that springs immediately to mind is how in the '90s I can very clearly recall a specific group of people saying that a president who cheats on his wife will cheat on his country. And the <laughs> right. same group of people is now convinced with every fiber of their being that an unfaithful president is not a big deal because you're choosing a leader, not a pastor. And mm-hmm. and I think that was that was a kind of credence that had to kind of quietly uh, get uh, put out to pasture while another one was trotted in. Uh, because the the group's attempts to structure power and values and boundaries uh, had to change because of circumstances. So I, I think the dynamic of of the interplay of of the the identity politics and and the credences and the access to power and resources is is such a fascinating feature of of all these things that are going on. Yeah, it's shocking how quick that one changed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it says to me that there's like an overarching credence, right? There's yeah. a, there's a there's a there's a superseding credence that's more important than you know these individual things, whatever that is. I I, I wouldn't even venture to know. What <laughs> yeah, is. yeah, there is. I mean, it, it's it's worth pointing out that you know, um, with respect to uh, uh, big picture credences of your in group. Those are are very much fixed, but with respect to the the more detailed ones, there's a lot of creativity and and, and making up and and so on and so forth. Like I was at the gym the other day, and I saw this this uh, what looked like a personal trainer uh, with a sweatshirt on that said something like "God is a personal trainer," <laughs> right? And you can kind of see how you can kind of see how you might want to think of God in that way, but there, there really is a certain amount of creative flexibility uh, and, and what I call in my earlier work, free elaboration uh, Mm -hmm. when it comes to how people imagine God. Right. And so I think that's, that's kind of um, supportive of, of, of my position, but, but still consistent with the ideas that uh, um, you know, for, for the, the group, defining religious credences there's they're more doctrinal and dogmatic and and hard to get rid of unless you unless you leave the group let well, me say one more thing yeah, uh, yeah if, dive in man if, if i can about about these these deconstructionists because i i think in a way that that is a, a group that uh um i would like to speak to i think one of the hard things about relieving uh, leaving a, a religion that was a freudian slip um <laughs> one of, one of the hard things about leaving a, a religion is that even if you kind of see clearly that the, the religious credences or the stories and doctrines are not for you, I think the emotional tendencies tend to persist, right? And I think that's really one of the more powerful things about uh, religious credences. So, so some people tell me, look, religious beliefs are factual beliefs because they're so serious. People must straightforwardly believe them. 
And my response to that is, well, you just underestimate the power of imagination. Because if you have an imaginative credence type relation to a certain story and doctrine, and you rehearse that every Sunday, week after week after week, it's going to inculcate certain emotional tendencies in you that make you bond to and that make you similar to your in-group members and that are going to stick with you uh, well after you you leave the church, right? I mean, I grew up in a Calvinist context, and even when I was a kid, the doctrine of original sin didn't seem that plausible to me, right? But I, I created it because that's what I was supposed to. But I think in, in terms of, you know, like talking to my therapist all these many years later, right, I can sort of see how this doctrine of original sin it sort of shapes how I feel about myself um, in in ways that, uh, well, frankly, I, I wish it wouldn't. But um, the important thing is, yeah, religious credences, they're not mere imaginings like you, you play make-believe that you're a robber for, for 10 minutes and it, then it goes away and you're not emotionally changed by that. The persistence with which we play the religious game of make-believe, it really does shape our own emotional tendencies. And, and I think the social function of that is to bond us to the in-group. But the the result of that is that it, the emotional tendencies don't go away, even when the credences are still there. And that's just uh, a sign of how effective the make-believe game actually is. I, I love that topic and here's what here's the mean thing that i'm going to do i like to do a mean thing at the end of every episode and this <laughs> one's a mean thing uh, i want to talk to you more about that idea of these uh these uh remaining psychological uh and 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 sort of uh, emotional things that that sort of track with people even after they leave religion but we're going to do it in the uh the patrons only after party so we're, we're for now we're going to leave the uh the the main uh recording and and thank you so much Neil for uh, for joining us today uh the book is and I'll hold we'll, we'll both we'll all hold yep. up our books there we go uh, oh, thanks. I, I I have um my my PDF of the book on my screen so I'll, I'll, I'll put up an imaginary <laughs> yeah one. exactly but uh, yes religion is make believe yep. uh, Neil Van Leyen thank you so much for uh for joining us today uh, i'm sure a lot of people will have a lot to chew on uh yeah I, I assume the book is just available sort of out in the world wherever you get fine books of this sort yeah let me let me say a, a word about that it's 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 available uh on amazon.com barnes and noble uh, i don't think it's in that many bookstores but easily findable online um harvard university press's website that's the that's the press that published it um, I will say it's it's uh, only in hardcover at the moment, so it's it's a little bit pricey. But I like to encourage people to recommend it to their local public library, uh, along with uh, whatever other books that they hear about on your podcast. Um, and that'll be a way of accessing it without so much cost, and then also a, a fun way of engaging with uh, the local public library. So encourage your, your, uh, listeners to do that. And, um, I would love to hear from people, uh, feedback on what they think. Uh, do, do you want to give people a way to give you their feedback? Sure. Well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll say, uh, my, my email is e address is easily findable. If you just Google me and I'm, I'm happy to hear from people. Okay. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, if you would like to hear the rest of uh, our conversation with Neil, you can become a patron at, patre at patreon.com slash data over dogma, where uh, if you're a $10 a month or more patron, you'll be able to hear all of our uh, patrons only content. Even lower uh, categories can get early access to an ad free version of every show. So that's always a great thing. If you'd like to contact us, please feel free to do so at contact at data over dogma pod.com. And we'll see you next week. Bye everybody. Data over dogma is a member of the airwave media podcast network. It is a production of data over dogma media, LLC copyright 2023, all rights reserved.